Coming up on 2020 on ID. American Sniper, a blockbuster at the box office. I'm ready to come home, baby. About a real-life American hero, Chris Kyle. He survived the most dangerous war zones, only to be killed on home soil at the hands of a fellow veteran. And somebody would shoot them in the back. He didn't have any chance. Now, the hero we didn't know. The sniper's wife, the American wife. Taya Kyle, reluctantly drawn into the spotlight. It's like my life lately has been the volume turned up all the way. I'm here. Your family is here. Your children have no father. You will have to serve my country. Behind the public persona, Taya invites Robin Roberts into her very private world. We always felt like it was one of the best places on earth, honestly. It's so serene. It is. On an emotional drive into the North Texas hill country, winding over creek beds, through prairies of blooming blue bonnets, miles of range bounded by barbed wire. A journey back to the darkest days in her love story with her husband. And it's horrible what happened, period, but in such a beautiful, peaceful area. And to the scene of the crime that shocked America, the gun range where Chris Kyle lost his life as a way of comforting myself in some ways i just thought well at least it was maybe peaceful and you didn't see it coming a brave taya kyle about to confront the ghost of an unimaginable loss you ready to do this good a story of love war and renewal welcome to 2020 on id I'm John Quinones. Millions are familiar with the story of Chris Kyle, the Navy SEAL who struggled to balance a fierce commitment to comrades in Iraq with his duties as a family man at home. But no one knows that story better than Taya Kyle, the wife who fought her own battle to hold their marriage together only to see her happiness shattered when Chris was murdered by another veteran of the Iraq War. Taya wrote an unflinching account of their marriage in her book, American Wife. And in 2015, she shared her story with Robin Roberts, from intimate family moments to the place where her husband lost his life to her commitment to keeping Chris's legacy alive. It is a story of unbreakable love. This is American sniper Chris Kyle as you've never seen him. Not in a Hollywood movie, but in a home movie. One of many, his wife Taya Kyle, is sharing exclusively tonight with 2020. You may not like everything, but it's for a reason. Faith is very important to Chris, too. Yes. The blessing of a new child. It seems like these that inspired Taya to write her book, American Wife, where she tells her story of love and loss with Chris. There was so much more to him. It was my chance to share some of that side, too, because I think he, um, I think he's earned it. For Taya, Chris was her unlikely soulmate, her cowboy in shining armor. He just had this softness and this tenderness. I continue to look back and be in awe of how he managed it all so well, honestly. When you open the book, four words jump out. Love, war, faith, renewal. Mm -hmm. Why those four words? Love certainly is always a key thing for me. It always has been, it probably always will be. And I mean, it, was, it brought the greatest pain in our marriage but it also brought greater strength. It's been a lifelong journey, but definitely it was more clear within my time with Chris how I had to rely on my faith. And then, you know, renewal is a, it's a constant process, you know. Four words for powerful forces shaping their lives from the earliest years. Born in Texas, Chris drifts from job to job as a ranch hand and professional rodeo competitor. He finally finds purpose in the Navy SEALs. During the grueling training program, he befriends fellow Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell, famous in his own right as the subject of the film Lone Survivor. The Mikey and Danny really did. People die all the time in our training, not not, not, not done with combat, just talking about training and blood and sweat every day. Chris not only survives, he thrives, showing immense talent as a sharpshooter, earning his SEAL trident. He's stationed in Southern California, where, as the movie shows, he meets Taya. She's working as a pharmaceutical sales rep, and as she says in her book, 
depressed after a series of bad relationships and an unsure future, praying for a man with a good heart. You know, I wanted to be really independent, um, even though I knew I kind of needed somebody. Her prayers would be answered during a night out at a bar of all places. Hello, <laughs> nice to meet you. What's your name? Taya. The chance meeting between Taya and Chris started off on a pretty rocky note, as seen in the film American Sniper. Okay, how true was that first meeting? So true. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I drank a little too much, and he held my hair back while I, you know, let it all back out. But um, great first impression. Yeah, Taya. right. I know. It's such a gentle, tender exchange, and I feel like that was so incredibly true mm -hmm. with. Chris, and that was what was so intriguing. Um, so yeah, it's, and it was funny. So, not exactly love at first sight, or was it? We're in a bar, you know, and he was so uh, genuine and, and had a depth to him in this really hot body with a cute face. When he told you what it was that he does for a living, I believe you said you didn't want to marry a seal. Right. Where are you going? Well, I was just going to go home because you said you wouldn't date a seal, so. Said I'd never marry one. My faith is different now because I think God has a plan. You can really try hard to, to think you know what's going to happen, but I don't think any of us do. And no, it wasn't my plan, but I'm so glad I did. So when did you know in your heart that he was the one? It was just little by little. He was so nice, really. I mean, just so nice. and. and supportive. He made me feel like he was excited to, to talk to me, to see me, and it was just this simple, fun, deep person. On March 16, 2002, Chris and Taya wed on a sunny California day, exchanging inscribed wedding bands. Taya wrote on Chris's ring, my life, my love, and he wrote all of me on her ring. But from day one, Chris is torn between love for his country and love for his family. They have to cut their honeymoon short because Chris is called up for duty. Marcus Luttrell's wife, Melanie, is a dear family friend. And they loved each other passionately. I think there was a lot of sometimes ups and downs through different events, but they're going to stay strong together afterwards. The struggle between family and military service would continue to test their marriage. But when he is home, Chris is committed to their growing family, a son who Chris immediately nicknamed Bubba. Give me a hug. And a daughter nicknamed Angel. That commitment, undeniable. It's these stolen moments that Taya treasures most. What kind of father was he? Amazing. Truly, I don't, I truly don't think there's a better example of what a father should be than him. I can barely think of a day, you know, there may have been less than 10 in our whole lives that I remember him not laughing with those kids no matter what kind of day he had. And then he held them to the high standard. You know, he expected them to look him in his eye and be polite and have good manners and do what they're told. And then he cuddled them, you know, he just, he was always available for hugs and, you know, big hugs and, and a lot of love. Here's a perfect day shot by Taya. Chris roughhousing, yeah. Navy SEAL style with Bubba, who can't get enough. Yeah. Yeah. And a game they called Poke the Bear, which inspired the filmmakers. Like a beast, right? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Taya's camera captures more than the fun times. She also records poignant, reflective moments like this. Listen closely as Chris talks to his son Bubba the night before his third deployment. Come here, Bubba. We'll read two more and then you can go to bed. This is a letter. When I'm gone, you can look at the tape. I know when he said, when I'm gone, he was referring to deployment. But he is gone. Mm -hmm. And this can be played. What are your emotions and your children when you, when you see this? I know that there was a part of him that also was referring to 
being gone for good. And that was always a possibility. When it, when it came down to would he be okay with dying on the battlefield, absolutely. But I think in the moments where you're holding your kid and thinking about not being there with them, that's when the pain, you know, comes in. And there was plenty of pain for Chris and for Taya. When we come back, trouble in the marriage. I remember crying to him and saying, I don't want to tell you this because what if this is the last time that we talk? I don't want to tell you this because I don't want you to worry about it. And what the home movies would reveal about a family in crisis. What's this you're going to bring for you? Sickness, <laughs> misery, <laughs> bankruptcy. Stay with us. Despite having doubts about ever marrying a Navy SEAL, Taya Kyle fell hard for her husband, Chris. Still, as they built their life together, the couple would find the war Chris was fighting half a world away had devastating repercussions much closer to home. Once again, here's Robin Roberts. Another day in this massive invasion of Iraq. In the fog of war, a sniper must make split-second life and death decisions. Who is friend? And who is foe? Here's the, the eye in the sky, the hand of God. I mean, that kind of deal. Watch our backs. He did it well. Took pride in the job. Loves his brothers. But as we saw an American sniper, playing judge, jury, and executioner weighs heavy on the heart, even for the man they called the legend. Yeah, she's got a grenade. She's got an RKG rushing. Stand to the kid. And you prepare for war to fight other men. But, you know, when you look at his experience, women and children, women putting their children in harm's way, not all... I can't imagine having to deal with that and see that. I mean, it's painful just to think about. But then there are those, especially when the movie came out, mm -hmm. there was some criticism in saying, is that truly being a sniper? Mm -hmm. Is that truly being a hero? How mm -hmm. did you handle that? There are a number of things that I learned from Chris's life, and I remember one of them when he was going off to deployment and there were protesters on the side of the street. Mm -hmm. And I kind of looked at him and said, are you okay? And he said, that's why we fight. You know, give them the right to say with their peace. I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty big, you know, to say that. So, um, yeah, there are critics, and that's okay. You know, they have a right to criticize it, and they have a right to examine it. To keep hold of his humanity, Chris keeps in touch with his wife. Taya says he never lost his softer side. It came out in his emails. He thought you were sexy. I know. Oh, I, know. I love how he would end. Yeah. Hey, sexy. And yeah. just what was that, uh, you know, to, to, to read that again and to know that yeah. he made you feel that way and that he thought that way yeah. of you. That's one thing any person can do in their relationship is remind the other person that they find them attractive mm. and, you know, beautiful in their worst moments. And he, he did that. But emails alone aren't enough to keep a marriage healthy. Chris chooses to re-enlist that means he will spend more time in Iraq with his band of brothers than at home with his family. This video is taken shortly after Angel is born. The moment is so touching, but also bittersweet. As Taya holds her infant, Chris is preparing to ship out for the fourth time. And you were angry at him. Yeah. That he went back, back yeah. weren't you? Yeah, I was. Simultaneously angry and thinking, I gotta love him so much, but you also know how are you supposed to be mad at somebody who's serving their country and putting their life on the line every day? Taya, juggling two children and the constant anxiety of a wartime military spouse is nearing her breaking point. I remember crying to him and saying, I don't want to tell you this. I don't want to tell you this because what if this is the last time that we talk? I don't want to tell you this because I don't want you to worry about it. Screenwriter Jason Hall got close to Chris and Taya while writing the movie American Sniper. I think the challenging part for her was, why is he choosing this over, over me and over us? By the end of Chris's fourth tour, Taya is no longer willing to share her husband with Uncle Sam. You kind of put your foot down and mm -hmm. saying, it's either us or right. the SEALs. It wasn't just for me and it wasn't just for the kids. This is a guy who would go until there was nothing left. And I felt like he was kind of on the precipice of not having much left. Finally, after 1,000 days in Iraq, Chris is home for good. The kids are happy to have dad back, and so is Taya. Daddy's being super daddy. He's putting together your Rip Rider, and you just got it. But this video doesn't tell the whole story. 
Chris is struggling to return to civilian life, a mission as tough as any he's faced. In what ways did it change Chris, did war change Chris? He had the sleepless nights, he had the high blood pressure, he had, you know, the horrible dreams. He moves his family to Texas and starts a security business, but money is short and the Kyles are facing bankruptcy. In this video, he can't hide his despair. So, what's this year going to bring for you? Sickness. Sickness, <laughs> misery, <laughs> bankruptcy. <laughs> Money problems aside, Chris is suffering from PTSD and shutting out Taya, even texting an ex-girlfriend. You were so brutally honest about the toll that it took mm -hmm. on the marriage mm -hmm. and kind of danced around the ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. He never really came completely open and saying, was he unfaithful or mm -hmm. was he not? How close did you all come to not making it as a couple? You know, we came really close a number of times. Chris couldn't tell Taya about everything, but he could write down his war experience with the same unflinching accuracy he'd used to aim his sniper's rifle. There was a part of him that had to just throw his crap on the table and, and stand and be accountable for it and hide from it. The unexpected blessing of Chris's book, The American Sniper, was all the people at the book signings and, and after his death who have said that they felt so blessed to have that perspective because they could relate to it. And it wasn't all military families either. I mean, there were athletes who could relate to it and spouses who could relate to it. The book is a bestseller. Hollywood comes calling. Clint Eastwood signs on to direct Bradley Cooper in the movie version. Cooper knows it's not going to be easy to fill Chris Kyle's size 14 boots. Everything you could possibly want a job to be, something that scares the hell out of you, um, something that brings you to a different place, but in the end changed my life, quite frankly. Bradley got to know Chris so well that he improvised by putting the teddy bear on his shoulders. How about kids? You want kids? Yeah, someday. And that, that just goes to show how much Bradley really got in the heart and mind of Chris. You like country music? Only when I'm depressed. And what about seeing herself on the big screen, played by Sienna Miller? And did you feel that Sienna was able to portray you the way you wanted to be portrayed? I spend a lot of time not talking about that because it's me and I'm more interested in talking about, you know, Chris or the military, this and that. But I thought it's almost ironic because the military wives often get ignored. And here I'm doing the same thing to her performance because I think she did a phenomenal job. I mean, not only did she do a great job with the accent, but man, when she was crying on film, I don't think we'll be here when you get back. It was making me hurt. American Sniper hits a bullseye at the box office, making over $300 million in the U.S., over $500 million worldwide, and receiving six Oscar nominations. The love story of Chris and Taya Kyle seemed destined for a Hollywood ending. But when I meet Taya for the first time on the Oscars red carpet, Chris is already gone. What do you think, though, he would think? All the nominations, best picture, 300 million at the box office. I know. Uh, you know what? He would be absolutely blown away, and he would be his usual happening for couples who are healing with this, this movie. When we come back, the story of what happens after the movie's ominous fade to black. Now, well, we need to get in the car. And my brother just came by here. He told me that he's committed a murder. And Tay and I make that emotional visit to the place where she lost her husband. And I just need to be with him, you know? I just want to be with him. Stay with us. The moment has arrived. Taya Kyle is finally ready to return with us to the place where Chris was taken from her. When you return here, is it is it hollow ground? Is it haunted ground? Is it? I don't know. It's something uh, that's confusing. Yeah. And it's almost unthinkable like, that somebody would do that right here. Standing here, Taya is brought back to the day everything changed. February 2nd, 2013. We just had our normal routine, you know, kids sports. It's nearly three years after Chris left Iraq and his war is finally over. 
Now a best-selling author, he not only has the means to support his family, he has conquered his demons. Here is the family, happy on vacation at the Grand Canyon. Home at last, in body and mind. He has even begun helping fellow vets adjust to civilian life, bringing them to shooting ranges like this to relax and open up. You can still make a difference in this, in this nation by the things that you do in your day-to-day -day life. One life that needed saving, Eddie Ray Ralph, a Marine who served in Iraq and in Haiti after the deadly earthquakes. When he got home, his life spun out of control. Violent episodes, even threats of suicide. Ralph's mother reached out to Chris for help. And even though Chris had never met Ralph, he agrees. Chris was going to go do something charitable and kind and something he really didn't have time for. He's one of those guys that made time. That brisk February morning, Chris asked his best friend, Chad Littlefield, to come with him and Ralph here to the Rough Creek Lodge gun range, a hunting resort about two hours southwest of Dallas. But when Chris and Chad pick up Ralph in Chris's big black truck around one in the afternoon, Ralph is wary and the feeling is mutual. The strange man in the back seat set off alarm bells for Chad and Chris. While driving, Chris texts Chad, this dude is straight up nuts. Chad responds, He's right behind me, watch my six. Military slang for watch my back. Still, when they arrive at the range, Chris goes ahead with the day's plan. Chris was definitely in the front and Chad was um, behind. And I know that he had just shot some old West kind of replica guns and both of them were empty. Ralph waits until Chris has fired all his shots down range and guns down Chad. Then, before Chris knows what's happening, Ralph shoots him six times, all in the back. I know that Chad and Chris both had their sidearms holstered and on safety. The shooter, I think, was over there, and um, he definitely had some, some loaded weapons that he turned on him quickly, uh, if not simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've ever been able to pinpoint if he had two, exactly. If he had two guns, it no could have been. I know they didn't, neither one of them. Thought coming. The man who survived a thousand days of war and made it home has been killed by a fellow veteran. Dying's one thing. Everybody dies, but you shot him in the back, man. You're a coward. Ralph takes Chris's gun and his truck and heads to his sister's house, telling her he just killed two men. The second he leaves, she calls 911. Listen, my brother just came by here. He told me that he's committed a murder. Taya hears the news from Mark Tribley, a family friend on the local police force. I immediately left the police station, went to his house. Taya immediately knew something was wrong. And I told her that it was confirmed that Chris had been murdered. I just looked at him. I remember looking in his eyes so intently and just saying, like, are you sure? because I've had these scares before where I thought he was dead and he wasn't. And he said yes. I just remember thinking, there's no way you're wrong. Like, there has to be. He was a survivor and a fighter, and you know, and honestly, I didn't know how many times he'd been shot or that somebody would shoot them in the back. He didn't have any chance, and I think that was part of it, is he was so capable. And he'd been in so many close calls that it didn't seem real. For so long, she had to worry when Chris was overseas. But once he came home, that put him in the clear. She didn't ever have to worry about that again. She thought she was going to have him for the rest of her life. And then all of a sudden, on a normal Saturday, she gets a knock at the door. And that, that immediately changed her life. When they came to the funeral home, I just said, I need to see him. Like, the minute he gets in, and, and I know they wanted to clean him up and all that stuff. And I... I I just couldn't have been more emphatic. And, um, and on the way there, one thing that I remember asking the guy who went with me, a friend of ours, V, I just asked him, I said, are his hands okay? And um, I said, it's fine if they're not, I just want to be prepared. And he said, no, I think they're okay. And I just wanted to hold his hand, you know? And even if it had been shot up, I still was going to hold his hand. But I just wanted to know before I went in. And people were concerned, you know, like, are you going to be okay going in? And I said, yeah, going in isn't going to be the problem. You know, getting me out of there is going to be the problem. And it turned out it was. That was the hardest part. How were you able to tell your children about what happened to Chris? 
It was one of the, the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I remember thinking, you know, maybe I'll take them outside so they don't have the memory of getting this news in the house. I just told them something really bad had happened and that daddy got hurt. And my daughter looked at me and she said, is he dead? And then I just, you know, shook my head and then just the sound from her chest and her stomach, that guttural cry came from is, she was thinking that couldn't possibly be true. It's mm -hmm. very hard to understand. They had the same questions we all have. Why would he do that? Mm -hmm. You know, why would somebody do that to daddy? Police track down Chris's truck within hours. This video shows police ordering Ralph to exit. Eddie! Eddie! Turn, it off, Eddie. Turn it off, Eddie! Then, unexpectedly, Ralph takes off, leading police on a high-speed chase through residential neighborhoods. At one point, police ram the truck. Eventually, Ralph surrenders. He is arrested and charged with the first-degree murder of Chris Kyle and Chad Littlefield. Nine days later, a rainy, gray day in Dallas. Thousands file into AT&T Stadium, home of Chris's beloved Dallas Cowboys, to pay their respects to a fallen American hero. I stand before you, a broken woman, but I am now and always will be the wife of a man who is a warrior both on and off the battlefield. Chris Kyle's funeral procession to the Texas State Cemetery, providing the movie's poignant final moments. The pictures taken from real life, like these unforgettable images captured by ABC stations, KVUE, and WFAA. The drive to Austin to the cemetery. It was 200 miles of people lined in the streets and on every overpass. And bagpipers and people stopped on the other side of the freeway. I mean, it was that feeling of patriotism and acceptance and that goes right in line with Chris's life. Taya still has mixed feelings about this place where her husband spent so much time. For him to lose his life in that manner has to just, he must look to the heaven. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, he didn't even have a bullet. Right. And it's gone. Right. Didn't and, even have a chance. Right. And I guess when I try to comfort myself, I think if God had gone to Chris and said, hey, if I can take your life, I'll inspire a lot of people. Are you willing? I feel like he probably would have said yes, you know? Mm -hmm. To be here where it actually happened because it makes me want to just pay my respects and say thank you to your husband. Really. Thank you. When we come back, Chris Kyle's accused killer gets his day in court. This matter is filed state of Texas versus Eddie Ray Ralph. His defense of insanity. The ones in the sky are the ones that fly, you know what I mean? And Taya's reaction. I wanted to come out of my seat like you don't have a right. Stay with us. In the dusty West Texas town of Stephenville, cowboy capital of the world, All rise. Taya Kyle comes to bear witness as the man who killed her husband is brought to justice. This matter styled State of Texas versus Eddie Ray Ralph. Two years later, Ralph looks very different. He's heavier and neatly dressed. What was it like being in that courtroom with him? You know, some of the pictures when it was autopsy type pictures and he'd be staring at them. I wanted to come out of my seat like don't you dare look at them in that vulnerable state that you don't have a right. It's a challenge for Taya just to be here. The two years since Chris was taken from her have been the darkest of her life. And I know Taya, you, you tried to remain as strong as you could mm -hmm. but you went down a deep hole. Mm -hmm. Depression in some ways. Mm -hmm. And you beautifully wrote that were it not for the children, you'd want to be where Chris was. Did you contemplate suicide? No. No. You know, there's a, I have a lot of compassion for people who, um, who feel that way, but I also know without a doubt that the people left behind are never the same. They're never okay. 
a phrase kept running through her mind, I don't understand. I think everybody goes through things in their life where they're like, this does not make any sense, or I don't understand why this is happening, but that's part of the journey to faith, I think, is to say it's okay not to understand all of the reasons why, but to see how you can be better for it and what you can take away from it, how you can help others, because we all have something. Well, that's faith. Faith right. is, the, is not seeing, not knowing. Right. That's why it's called faith. Yes, yes. All right, Mr. Nash, you may call your first witness. The state calls Taya Cotton. Taya will need every ounce of her faith to get through this trial. Who were you married to prior to February the 2nd, 2013? Chris Kyle. Okay. She introduces the American sniper few knew. The good son, the family man, celebrating their last Easter. I was outside our house on Easter morning. Chris hiding Easter eggs for the kids. The state's case, crime scene photos, x-rays of fatal bullets, a recreation of the shooting. We got the shooter in position sitting right there. No doubt, Ralph did it. He didn't just want Chad dead. He wanted Chad dead. Dead, 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 dead. And he wanted the same for Eddie Ray Ralph's defense. Psychosis, delusion, schizophrenia, he was crazy. Not guilty by reason of insanity. In and out of mental hospitals four times in the 18 months before the killings. Diagnosed with psychosis and PTSD. Even though he never saw combat. Doctors prescribed half a dozen or more medications. Your Honor, I offer State's Exhibit 331. He certainly seems to be acting strangely when police interview him the night he was arrested. The ones in the sky are the ones that fly, you know what I mean? The pigs in the world. Schizophrenia. Dr. Mitchell Dunn says Ralph was schizophrenic with delusions of cannibals and strange creatures. You know what I mean? The pigs. He began to think that both the Mr. Collin and Mr. Littlefield were some type of pig assassins. He was acting in self-defense to kill them before they killed him. Ralph's lawyers say veterans administration doctors should have kept him in the hospital. Did the VA fail here? You know, I think there are a lot of issues with the VA. I really do. In this situation, though, you know, this guy manipulated. Every time he got in trouble, he used some sort of excuse. But the prosecution says maybe Ralph just wanted to be the man who shot Chris Kyle. If you kill somebody known as the American sniper, it might make you feel important. Yes, that's possible. It is time for the jury heads on in their ears. This defendant gunned down two men in cold blood, shooting them in the back in our county. Find him guilty. Jurors deliberate together, pray together, and then decide. The way he carried out these murders and then in his actions afterwards. The reloading of the gun, the taking the truck. He ran from the police. He may have had some mental issues, but I don't think it rose to the level of that he didn't know what he was doing was wrong. I've been advised the jury has reached a verdict in this matter. Is this correct? Yes, Mr. Ralph, you'll please stand. We, the jury, find the defendant, Eddie Ray Ralph, guilty of the felony offense of capital murder as charged. The sentence is automatic. Life without parole. When we come back, can Taya ever forgive? It's a struggle at times. Right. I mean, that he, he took something. And she considers the possibility of new love. But you even said, Taya, that you heard Chris saying he wants you to allow yourself to find another love. When we come back. This is your home. You're very private about it and rightfully so. It is springtime in Texas and Taya Kyle invites us to her new home. So are you at peace here? It is peaceful, and I feel like it's a, you know, a real blessing that I can wake up in the morning and, you know, you can hear the birds chirping and the trees. The trial seems far away, but her feelings about the man who took her husband's life are ever-present. 
I had a friend tell me, you know, showed in the Bible that there are stories where he forgives the person immediately, but there's still a consequence for their actions and sometimes it's long term. And I needed to hear that because I was thinking forgiveness meant it's okay. No, forgive yeah. the, and that's the thing. When you don't forgive, it's you're hurting yourself, giving that person that you're letting them off the hook. Right. No, you're not. Right. Taya may still struggle with forgiveness, but the hate is behind her. That's why God tells us not to hate, because the moments where I had just disdain, disgust, like any focus on that person, it hurt me. In this new season, time for a new purpose, Taya is committed to keeping her husband's legacy alive. Welcome to Lubbock, Texas. We travel with her to Lubbock, Texas, where she speaks with kids at Trinity Christian School. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm Taya. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Ezra. After taking care of unlaced sneakers, she takes questions. What are your kids saying when they hear your father the hero? I think that they they know that all of our service members are heroes. And they also know that sometimes just having a mom and a dad who love you, that's really just as important. Maybe even a bigger reason to call somebody a hero. There's Q&A with some high school kids taking time for pictures with anyone who asked. Taya meets two young men who will soon be serving the country. Yeah. John Beck is headed to uh, West Point. West oh, West wow. Point. I feel like crying. I don't know why it's emotional, <laughs> but I, um, I wish the best for you guys and I'll be praying for you. Just don't lose yourself. Don't be afraid to talk about it if it gets hard, you know? 1,500 people come to see her for a fundraiser that night. There's no speech. She just tells her story. In my darkest hour, the littlest things made the difference. It was the people who didn't have the words, but just showed up to hold my hand or give me a hug. They auction off a rifle, an autographed copy of Taya's new book, and a hunting dog. 14-week-old female black lab. You know what her name is? Sniper. No, I've got a couple yeah. yards. Yeah. You better number two. No, they're alive because of this. Oh, thank you for telling me that. They raise $100,000 for the Chris Kyle Frog Foundation. The money will go to help take care of veterans and... Let's talk about the foundation. One of the key things, and it's important to me, is that it's for first responder families as well as veterans because he cared about them and they're fighting the battles on the home front but their marriages are taking a toll and they start strong these are strong people that are willing to take on that kind of lifestyle and they could use our help back home Taya takes me to see a special place on the property the stable it's kind of fitting with everything we've read about Chris he was a cowboy right, right. cowboys have horses right right his spirit is something that it's it's important to me to Keep that alive for the kids and you know they've been robbed but i'm going to do my part to try to help them know their dad through different experiences and um horses might be one of them you know look at you looking good did you ever think you'd marry a cowboy no but it was exciting i never probably thought a cowboy would want me but <laughs> Before we say goodbye, Taya and I find time to go riding. And I'll tell you right now, neither one of us is getting on any wild horses the way Chris Kyle once did. What is it that you like about riding? Well, I love the fact that the animals have that. I feel like there's sort of a spiritual sense to them. And I like the uh, peace of it. I just think they're magnificent animals, you know? And there's no place like the back of a horse to give you a fresh perspective on what's around the bend. Which brings us to a story Taya tells those high school students about her son. He said something to me about dating. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not interested. And he goes, okay, good. And I said, you want mama to die a lonely old shrew? And um, he goes, yeah. I'll love you. I know no one can replace Chris, but I do hope that she finds love with someone. Taya writes in her book about a big decision. She says she took off her wedding ring and moved it to her right hand. So we were in for a bit of a surprise when we sat down to talk. I've been trying to look at things, the which, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you, uh -huh. you talked about switching hands uh -huh. with, yeah. with the ring. So, so but it's back it's, on the left. It's yeah. back on the left. <laughs> the wedding band is back on her left hand, right where Chris Kyle put it 13 years ago. So why is it back on the left? I knew it. I know, I just couldn't do it. I just, you know, I, I kept it on the right for quite a while. But you even said, Taya, that you heard Chris mm -hmm. saying 
He wants you to be able to allow yourself to find another love. I do believe it, and I can allow for that possibility that the love I have for Chris doesn't have to change. It's just not what I wanted, you know? Two steps forward, one step back. But she'll get there, with Chris still at his family's side. You wrote uh, and about how you and really your daughter, she talks to her daddy. Yeah. He talks to her. Yes. Yeah. It's so incredible and you know everybody can have their own beliefs on it and I feel like sometimes you have to experience something yourself to really buy into it but it's one of those things where it really doesn't matter I guess what anybody else thinks because she has a relationship there and my son does too in a different way and they'll find their way and it may ebb and flow but they will never ever have any doubt that they were loved and that they're still you know, being watched out for in some capacity by him, if it's through me or if it's by, by him. No matter what the future holds for Taya Kyle, she'll never forget, as her favorite Randy Travis song put it, the man who whispered her name. I heard a night bird call to its name when I heard you whisper my name. You said that song mm, captures what Chris was all about. How so? It's just this quiet presence of somebody who knows you as somebody that saves you. And he did save me. I still heard you whisper my name. As of 2016, Taya Kyle says her time is spent primarily with her family. But she does continue to share her story of hope and perseverance through speaking engagements, and her work with the Chris Kyle Frog Foundation. One event, she reports, raised more than half a million dollars. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID. Coming up on 2020 on ID. A small town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's in everybody's business. A deadly feud. It's delusion, it's depravity. And a whole lot of lonely. A sheltered young woman with a little girl's voice living her life on Facebook. She was really good behind a keyboard. As long as she didn't have to do it face to face. But when online friendships unravel. I was a bad person. I was horrible. I went through a whole lot. She was always saying that somebody was mad at her, somebody hated her, somebody wanted to kill her. Everyone takes sides. I remember I wrote, please do not write on Janelle's Facebook. I, I beg you, please don't do this. The cauldron is boiling amongst these players, all egging each other on. Then... Honey, I think it made me sad. Oh, my God. Two people murdered. There's no cost on either one of them. The kids. It was a precision execution in and out, happened very quickly. Facebook. Facebook. Facebook defriending that led to murder. And a bizarre tale begins to unfold. What a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Stashes of arms. We had rifles, shotguns, semis, secret recordings. You got rid of everything. And a secret agent in their midst? Is the CIA here? CIA? It appeared that there was some type of conspiracy here. That in those days they kept referring to a guy named Chris. Taps on a keyboard lead to murderous mind games. You know, she may be operating on a fourth grade level, but she's got a PhD in manipulation. Hashtag unfriended. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. The story you're about to see is as old as time. It's about unrequited love, rage, and revenge. But it also has a frightening modern twist because much of the bullying and threats that fuel this tragedy played out online. And then there was the shadowy figure cloaked in emails. Who was he? And was he the one pushing someone to commit murder? 
As Matt Gutman first reported in 2015, it all took place in a tiny town just three square miles. To talk to someone there, all you really had to do was just walk down the street. Drive up the winding mountain roads of northeast Tennessee and you'll find breathtaking views, stunning scenery. They don't call it Mountain City for nothing. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's related by blood or marriage to everybody else. They all go to the same churches. The sign at the city limits would like to suggest this is a congenial community of 2,500 with its arms wide open. The sign welcoming people to Mountain City says uh, a friendly hometown. Friendly to you? Uh, no. Why not? Because I wasn't born and raised here. I didn't grow up here. People here do not like outsiders. Janelle Potter could have used a good friend. Plagued with debilitating health problems since she was little, she's now a loner who spends most of her time inside this shuttered ranch house. Under the watchful eyes of parents, Buddy and Barbara Potter. What kind of person is she? Good natured, sweet person. She's not an angry person. Naive, young, innocent? Yes, very naive. She's young in her mind, more young than her age, I think. And although she doesn't sound like it, Janelle is 30 years old. She looks good, right? Her room is filled with stuffed animals that stand in as friends. She doesn't work, doesn't drive, and she confides in us she's never been with a man. What were the rules? Don't be out past, you know, 12 o'clock at night. No smoking, no drinking, no partying, stuff like that. They are a God-fearing and gun-loving family. Even when they garden, they pack heat. Mom, Barbara, had a job with Hewlett Packard. And Dad, Marvin Potter, better known as Buddy, was a former Marine who served in Vietnam rescuing POWs. And later, he says, he served with the CIA. Sounds like Rambo. I just saw him as a gentle giant. But age has taken its toll. Both are now disabled, Buddy even on an oxygen tank. But Janelle's life support becomes social media. So because you didn't drive, that's one of the reasons that your social world became the computer. Yes. I had a lot of family pictures on there. Random pictures of sceneries, dogs. Selfies? Any selfies? Selfies. Mm -hmm. Did your parents have access to your Facebook page? Did they monitor yes. it? Yes. A woman in your late 20s and your parents have access to your Facebook page? Well. But a simple trip to the pharmacy would be a turning point in Janelle's life. Employee Tracy Greenwell remembers the day she first met Janelle. When she first came in, what did she look like? Sweet and innocent. I mean... She's got the big blue eyes, right? Mm-hmm. The sweetest thing you'd ever think you'd see. Tracy takes it upon herself to befriend the social misfit Janelle. We felt sorry for Janelle. She was sheltered from sick and stuff. She gave me her phone number and I started calling her. I would go out with her to um, the mall, uh, to her house and out to eat. They even got her to repel. These are pictures of the new Fast Friends at Backbone Rock, a local landmark. Sitting next to a scared Janelle is Tracy's brother, Billy Payne, a jokester who likes the outdoors. Did you ever get the impression that maybe she liked Billy? That's what everybody says. She fell in love with Bill, but I didn't. I still don't say it like that. Instead, Tracy tried pairing Janelle up with someone else, introducing her to Jamie Curd. An older man who's pretty handy with computers, the kind of guy who likes to wear shades indoors. Well, Jamie was sort of rough looking, you know, greasy, and she was neat. So why did you think to set up Jamie and Janelle? Hey, Jamie didn't have a girlfriend, and she really didn't have a boyfriend. I mean, they didn't look like they'd go together by no means. Janelle and Jamie became an unlikely item, hiding their relationship from her strict parents. He's at the Potter house from time to time, supposedly to fix the family's PC. But behind her parents' back, Janelle and Jamie would steal time and a few kisses together, snapping these secret romantic selfies. You and Jamie got pretty serious at one point. Yes. He, uh, he gave you a cell phone so that you guys could talk without your parents being on the phone. Yes. How often would you talk? Every day. For long periods? Uh, for an hour, two hours at a time. Now, take note of Jamie Curd and all that clandestine canoodling, because you're going to hear a lot more about him a little bit later. But even while she's with Jamie, Janelle is still secretly pining away for that outdoorsman she met, Billy Payne. 
And right around that time, something sinister is happening with her online relationships. She's being relentlessly cyberbullied. Appalling anonymous comments begin appearing on her Facebook page. What kinds of things were people saying about you? Just that I was a bad person, that I was horrible, threatened to get raped. Must have been pretty scary. Yes. I remember I wrote, please do not write on Janelle's Facebook. I begged them, please don't do this. And Janelle thinks she knows who it is, pointing the finger directly at one of her so-called Facebook friends, Billie Jean Hayworth. What was her relationship like with Billie Jean? Oh, she hated her. From the get-go? Mm -hmm. She'd call her all kinds of bad names, but we didn't know, I mean, she wouldn't never say Janelle. It was always somebody else. Meaning Janelle was posing as somebody else, talking bad smack about, about. Yeah. And then when they would confront her, she'd be like, I didn't do that or whatever. There might be another reason these two don't get along. Billie Jean is engaged to, guess who? The object of Janelle's obsession, Billie Payne. Lindsay Thomas is Billie Jean's best friend. She was very laid back. Um, she liked to have a good time, always laughing, always had a smile on her face, just really easy going. And she and Billy had something to be especially happy about, a seven-month-old baby boy. Oh, he was her world. Um, just, just this glow she had about her when he came into the world was just unbelievable. Friends say Janelle was so jealous of Billy and Billie Jean's relationship that she started spewing some online venom of her own. She talked about how bad they partied and they were on drugs and, you know, just all kinds of lies. I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse. Did anybody believe it? No. And then Janelle's posts turned vicious. That she wished that Bill and Billie Jean and that damn baby would die. An all-out Hatfield and McCoy-like feud erupts on social media, pitting Janelle against Billy and Billie Jean. The cauldron is boiling amongst these players, all egging each other on. She was always saying that somebody was mad at her, somebody hated her, somebody wanted to kill her. She was paranoid about it, I thought. But so far, it's all just virtual violence. But then it escalated. I was calling the police a lot. Me up, but I don't like this because I'm very sick. They were wanting to blow my dad's truck, throwing rocks at the house. These are police photographs of a rock that landed in the Ponder front yard. Written on it were two names, Billy Payne and Billy Jean. And across the side, quote, I'm your Huckleberry. Now, at one point, did they unfriend you on Facebook? Um, I think that we did it to each other. I unfriended them, they unfriended me. Who unfriended who first? Um, I did Bill first, and I think Billy did me, and I unfriended her. But unfriending would only be the beginning. There's no talk. They're white. They're kid. There's no baby involved. When we come back, the young couple's house becomes a crime scene. My impression after, you know, the first week was it looked like a hit. Like a contract hit. Right. Suspects in custody and an investigation that leads all the way to the CIA. It's so incredible. The story is simply unfathomable. Stay with us. Thirty-year-old Janelle Potter has spent much of her life inside her room. Her world revolved around online social media. But an all-out feud with two friends has turned all their lives upside down. Now, this situation is about to take a very dark turn. Once again, Matt Gutman. Johnson County 911. At approximately 10.30 a.m. on a blustery January morning, a call comes into the Johnson County, Tennessee 911 dispatchers. There's a baby involved. He don't look right. The caller is a friend of Billy Payne and Billy Jean Hayworth. She's dropped by the young couple's home to find the back door open and inside something much worse. Their infant son covered in blood, eerily silent but unharmed. He's in one room, she's in the other right to play pen. It kind of looks like she's tried to get to her baby. The baby's father, Billy Payne, and Billy Jean, his mom, the young couple who had been feuding with Janelle, have been shot. 
big and yellow. They got their faces, they're swelled, they're black and blue. They've been beaten. Okay, do you want to attempt to do CPR? They're both dead. It's too late. This murder, these murders have literally torn apart the sleepy little town of Mountain City, Tennessee. Special Agent Scott Lott with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation takes 2020 inside the crime scene. And this is the bedroom where Billy was found. Single shot. Single shot in the face. Billy Payne's throat had also been slashed as he lay in bed. Down the hall in the nursery, Billy Jean had been cradling their baby in her arms when she died. That's how they find her, still holding her seven-month child. So it didn't take much time to get from that room to this room to shoot. No. And then this is five feet. I think it takes a cold-blooded person to shoot somebody holding a baby. Miraculously, the seven-month-old survived without a scratch. Investigators begin to examine all the possibilities. Of course, you know, the first thought is that you have to rule out, is it a murder-suicide? Is it a domestic situation? The second one, is it a um, drug deal or something like that gone bad or something? Were you able to glean very much forensic evidence from this scene? It is a very clean scene as far as physical evidence goes. So no prints, no shell casings, no DNA left behind? Not that we found, no, sir. Would that lead you to believe that whoever did this killing had some training? It looked like a hit. Like a contract hit? Right. But who in the so-called friendly hometown of Mountain City, Tennessee, would put a hit on a young couple who just worked at the local cotton mill? Word spreads fast in small towns like this one. And the day after the murders, Chief Deputy Joe Woodard goes to the Potter's home to talk to Janelle and her parents, Barbara and Buddy. We went to the residence and just more or less conducted an interview with them in the very beginning. Why did you decide to go to them? Because the, we knew that they had trouble with them. Trouble, like that social media catfight between Janelle and the two victims. Scott lost with a Tennessee girl. Oh, okay, nice to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. The plotters don't know it, but the detectives are secretly recording their interview. What we're doing right now is investigating the double homes. Very serious matter. From the start, Janelle's dad is defensive. Everybody always points a finger at us for something. Oh, no, there ain't nobody pointing a finger. Do you know of anybody that would hurt them, won't hurt them? No, actually, I don't. I feel bad about the situation because I didn't want no harm on them. Initially sympathetic, Janelle soon lets it fly about the bad blood between her and her former Facebook friends. They've been harassing me in my driveway, on our property, and then yesterday morning when I got on Facebook is when I found out that they were harassing me. I mean, I'm sorry it happened, but... I mean, that's all I could tell you is they, they have been harassing the living crap out of me. Why well, would they be harassing? It came out to be a jealousy thing. They said I was too pretty. But then the cops want to talk about somebody else. Remember Jamie Kurd, Janelle's secret sweetheart? Police know he had a falling out with the victims and took Janelle's side in the feud. What's Jamie to you? He's just a friend. We've been friends for years. He's friend of our family. Yeah, I yeah he's friend of all of us to me. Seems as if Janelle is still covering up her romantic relationship with Jamie from her overprotective parents. Jamie sound like your boyfriend? No. No. No, he's just a really good friend. Does he want to be your boyfriend? Not that I know of. But detectives are still suspicious Jamie and Janelle are a lot closer than she's letting on and wonder what he might know about the murders. Jamie. So they haul Jamie Kerr downtown and ask him to take a polygraph. You can tell he's nervous. We confront him with the results of the polygraph. And the results? Kurd fails miserably. The polygraph indicates that he lied about knowing the identity of the killer. Now investigators think they've got their man. I think you went in there. I'm going to take care of this situation. I'm going to take care of people messing with Janelle. People ain't going to mess with my girl no more. She's not my girl. You may say that out loud, but you know in your heart the difference. But hours go by, and Jamie Kurt still denies that he's involved in the murders. Were you the only person there when they were killed? I wasn't there. Then, out of the blue, it's Jamie asking them a question. 
a bizarre one which has the investigators dumbfounded. Is the CIA here? CIA? No. No. Jamie, in that interview, had said something to, to the effect of, is the CIA here? Of course, that was a very strange question to me. Can I ask the question? Yeah. Uh, why did you ask about the CIA? Um, because uh, they uh, said they worked for them. It's going to be a major breakthrough in the case. Jamie tells detectives that he'd been texting with a mysterious man named Chris, who told him he was in the CIA, who says his job was to protect Janelle from her enemies. Is that he is going by Billy? But why in the world would a CIA agent be involved in this tiny town's deadly internet feud? There's 2,500 people there. There's a guardian angel CIA agent. I smell a rat. And when we come back... I'm not going to tell you I did something I didn't do. Why has Janelle's disabled father suddenly become a suspect? I said you would never, ever consider hurting someone over this, would you? Next. Have a seat there, Jamie. It's 10 p.m. at the Johnson County Sheriff's Office, a department so small that the chief deputy's office doubles as an interrogation room. Jamie Kurt has been in the hot seat for nearly six hours, interrogated about the double murder of a young couple that allegedly bullied his girlfriend, Janelle. Let's tell you what's going to make you feel better when you tell us the truth. After a bizarre exchange with detectives about Jamie being in touch with someone supposedly in the CIA, Jamie's about to drop a bombshell, pointing a finger at someone much closer to home. Who shot? Hey, hey, who? Buddy? Yes. Jamie's just named Buddy Potter, Janelle's overprotective father, as the killer. Buddy, the senior citizen former Marine who needs a six-pack of oxygen just to breathe, He's not exactly your central casting assassin. Buddy Potter, because he has so many ailments. He's very ill. He's on an oxygen tank for Pete's sake. No way could he ever pull this off. In an attempt to save his own skin, Jamie agrees to help police snare Buddy. With detectives recording the conversation, Jamie calls his accomplice. It's a trap to get a confession on tape. Well, they're uh, open fingers. Oh, gee, Merry Christmas. You got rid of everything as from Bill Denny. Uh-huh. Okay. That makes me feel up there. Yeah. It wasn't exactly a smoking gun, but it was enough for detectives to move in and arrest Janelle's father, Buddy, in a pre-dawn raid. Gun-loving Buddy was almost always gun-toning, so police were on high alert. We knew he had a weapon, and at one point we thought he made a gesture to us. What, sort of, what kind of gesture? Show like me. He's going to do like this, and we grabbed his arm. And, and was he in fact armed? He was. Now it's Buddy's turn to answer some tough questions. You know why you're here, right? Yeah, I'm assuming. Okay, why do you think you're here? That somebody's told you I'm the one who killed somebody. Initially, his, his body language, you could tell he wasn't being truthful with us. Here's the thing. We're not looking at you, Heaven Nuts. We want you to help yourself. I'm not going to tell you I did something I didn't do. He denied everything. We pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. Are you a cold killer? Take care of your family. Which one are you? I'm protecting my family to start with, but I, I did not do this. Detective Lott then employs a tried and true interrogation tactic. Let the suspect implicate someone else. I think Jamie talked you into it. I think Jamie is secretly in love with you, Dan. Okay? No. This is his way of proving to Buddy that I can take care of her, I can protect her. Now, that wouldn't prove to me that he can't care of her now. But Buddy's not taking the bait, and Agent Lot is getting nowhere fast. So, he changes his strategy, switching from inquisitor to sympathizer. I believe you are sick and tired the most precious person in your life being attacked and harassed constantly. I know that. Okay? Ever since 
all this crap started, I've been, I've had my wife threatened, my wife has been threatened, they've threatened to take Janelle, cut her head off. Agent Lott's tactic works, and they're able to drill down to his motives. When you hear people plotting to take you, catch your daughter in a restroom and murder her, they want to rape her because she's a virgin, and just so much Finally, after an exhaustive four hours, a broken buddy breaks down. He's crying. I'm pressing. I got it right now. Janelle bothered me what you do. Agent Lot senses that Buddy is right on the verge of a confession. So he uses another ploy. And they hit pay dirt when they get him to call his wife Barbara. We let him make a phone call to Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. Before you find out from somebody else that wants you to know I was involved in it and I did it. What? Some, some of it. And he told Barbara I did it. And that's as that's as close to a confession as we got from him. Buddy's wife, Barbara, seems eager to provide him with an alibi. Your husband confessed to it. Yeah, but there's questions about that. So why would he admit to it? Why would he confess? When they took him, they took no oxygen. They took no medication. And they interviewed him for hours. And he, when he, his oxygen gets low, he says things that don't make sense or are incorrect. You need to just say, you know. You're not Gary, you're not Gary. But police think they've got a pretty good case, and now they're out to build it. They execute a search warrant on the Potter house. So did you notice anything odd in the house or anything unusual? Whenever the investigators went downstairs, there was a lot of firearms. We had rifles, shotguns, semi, I mean, it's just one of those. An arsenal. An arsenal, basically, yes. How downstairs. many? I would say probably close to maybe 60 different guns 60 and it wasn't just in the basement guns in the corner of the bedroom guns inside the dresser drawer and guns under the mattress there's even an ammo belt draped around his oxygen tank they had guns out the yin yang it's pretty overwhelming looks like buddy's taking his right to bear arms to an extreme yep that's an ak-47 you're looking at and there were knives too all around the house, even hanging from the antlers on the wall. But there was more. We even found pictures of the victims that were in the living room. In the you living found room. pictures of the victims in the living room? Yes, we sure was did. Was this some sort of mourning thing that they were trying to mourn for the victims? No, I don't think so. No, it certainly wasn't. These were Facebook pictures of Billie Jean and her friends. Was anything written on them? I think one of the pictures, I believe one of them had like bitch on it. Which is kind of an odd thing to find after someone has been murdered in their house yes, holding their baby. Exactly. And something else you may notice, all the pictures appear to be ripped in half. The cops caught Janelle's mother red-handed trying to destroy evidence. Then all of a sudden she ripped it in half. And I stopped her and I said, give me those pieces of paper. In total, authorities seized 51 items from the Potter house, including the family computer Janelle spent most of her time on. And when they impound Buddy's truck, Look what they find. Three enormous bags stuffed with shredded documents. We took those shredded documents. One of our agents spent a month of her life taping those back together. That agent meticulously reconstructed more than a hundred pages that turned out to be emails. The lines from the shredder still visible. The emails are between the Potters and a shadowy figure named Chris, who was warning them that the murder victims had been plotting to kill Janelle. It appeared that there was some type of conspiracy here. They, you know, they, they kept referring to a guy named Chris, uh, that's supposedly a CIA operative or, or something. Who is Chris? This stunning revelation about his identity and his jaw-dropping relationship to Janelle. Next. In any other middle American crime yard, the cops would have called it a day. They've got two suspects in custody, Janelle's father, Buddy, and her boyfriend, Jamie, for gunning down Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth. 
Now, both men have confessed to being involved, and both are awaiting trial. But the most unbelievable twist yet was on that Appalachian horizon. It's not really a who done it to me, it's a why did they do it? Barbara Potter can't make sense of the fact that Buddy is behind bars. He's never been violent. He's never, even neither one of us ever broke the law. Uh, we tried to be, to do the right thing, always. And yet, there he is at the Johnson County Jail, accused of first degree murder. So how was such a heinous murder conducted? I don't, how would I know that? Remember, a search of the Potter's home reveals an arsenal of weapons and bags of shredded emails. At least 100 pages got taped back together. And in those emails, conversations between Barbara Potter and a man named Chris, who says he worked for the CIA. Warning Barbara about threats to her daughter's life. Chris was doing some surveillance and intelligence work, right? He said he was. Who is Chris? I have no idea who this Chris person is. What was his job? Uh, he was a CIA agent. What kind of stuff did he do? He said he was down here to protect me, protect my parents. But why would a CIA agent descend on such a sleepy small town? Could it have something to do with Buddy's service in Vietnam? Barbara says that part of her husband's past is top secret. Is he allowed to talk about what he did? No. Never. Was he ever in the CIA or attached to the CIA? Uh, he, he said he was. Chris told Barbara, Janelle's mom, he was watching their every move and was monitoring all that venom the victims were allegedly spreading on social media. He was watching these people, he said, that were harassing her on, on the computer and calling her. In Mountain City, Tennessee, there's 2,500 people there. There's a guardian angel CIA agent. No. Police are rolling their eyes, too. And when they take a closer look at the computer they've seized from the house, a eureka moment. Those emails from Mr. CIA man Chris were all coming from an IP address that belonged to her daughter, Janelle. Every one of them pointed straight back to the hospital road in Mountain City, which was Barbara and Janelle's home address. That leaves police to deduce only one thing. There is no Chris from the CIA. It was a creation concocted by Janelle Potter to convince her parents she was in danger. She invented this character. Exactly, exactly. When she invented Chris, she could assume a different identity and be as hateful as she wanted to be. And prosecutor Dennis Brooks says the timing of Chris's appearance on the scene was no accident. The Chris emails start after Billy Jean Hayworth moves in with Bill Payne and gets pregnant. All this might seem far-fetched, but assuming a false identity online happens more often than you think. It's called catfishing, and there's even a whole TV show about it. How come you've been pretending to be someone else? Um... So she's catfishing her mom from the same house, from the same computer. She bought it hook, line, and sinker. How is that possible? Buddy Potter, at some point in his military career, had some involvement with the CIA. I think his wife, Barbara, was enamored with that. And Janelle grew up in that environment. So I believe the more she fed that back to her parents, the more it just kept growing and growing. It's beyond absurd. In all catfish cases, at some point, the, the victim of the catfishing is, is, is guilty of some degree of being naive. But Janelle's mother, Barbara, is about to go from naive to nefarious. And in those email exchanges, it sure sounds like she wants Billy Payne and Billy Jean dead. In one email to Chris, Barbara writes, we've had enough. No one wants to kill anyone, but we will. Barbara would take this information and show it to Buddy. Buddy, look. Look what they're trying to do to Janelle. Look what they're trying to do. And finally, they just pushed him to his limit where he couldn't take it anymore. Janelle just catfished herself and her mom into police crosshairs. Now the cops want to know where they were the morning of the murders, focusing on the wee hours when Janelle is exchanging secret text messages with her beau, Jamie Kurd, and it sure sounds to police like Janelle knows exactly what her father and her boyfriend are about to do. At 4.39 a.m., this message. Yes, he's leaving now. I hear the car. Police believe she's talking about her father on the way to pick up Jamie. The final text a minute later. I love you. Text me ASAP when you get back. 
and then all of a sudden the text messaging ends. And presumably around five in the morning, Buddy picks up Jamie and they drive over there. Over to the victim's house where they savagely kill Billy Payne and Billy Jean. For prosecutor Dennis Brooks, it's all proof that these murders were a family affair. And one thing that was very telling about Janelle being involved in the, in the preparation for the killing is, is the text messaging she does. Coming up, Janelle in jail, where our interview turns sour. Chris was you. No. You are Chris. I can't do this. I think we're done there. We're done. And will Barbara throw her own daughter under the bus to save her own bacon? I love her, but I'm not going to serve life for her. No. Stay with us. The Potters got problems. The trial for a mother and daughter charged with murder started today in Jonesboro. The courtroom was filled with emotion as Barbara and Janelle Potter were arraigned. Prosecutors accused them of masterminding the murder of a young couple they had bickered with on Facebook. The family patriarch, Marvin Buddy Potter, confessed to killing Billy Payne and Billy Jean Hayworth and was found guilty at trial. He is serving two life sentences. His accomplice, Jamie Curd, copped a plea deal for 25 years, but now under arrest is what's left of this dysfunctional family, Barbara Potter and her daughter, Janelle. Charles first degree murder. Three and a half years after the murders, the mother and daughter had their day in court. Through seven days of testimony, prosecutor Dennis Brooks tries to convince the jury that Janelle was really the one who authored all those emails supposedly from Chris, catfishing her own parents and goading her father into those executions. Case in point, all that childish writing and those misspellings. R-E-S-O-N, similar uh, throughout the documents. Ironically, it's the same argument her attorney, Cameron Hyder, makes in her defense. Janelle Potter operates on the level of an eight or nine year old. Essentially saying Janelle lacks the brain power to mastermind a murder. My client is not guilty for having an overprotective father. So just because Buddy went and did something horrific doesn't mean that Janelle directed him to do it. Absolutely. She is not capable of directing anyone to commit murder. It's just not in her. A countrified cast of characters takes the stand, but one prosecution witness brought gasps to the courtroom. My name is Christopher Jaden. Chris Jaden, a handsome former high school classmate of Janelle's, one she hasn't seen in 15 years. She was, uh, you know, one of those kids that <laughs> just very strange. But Chris must have made a much bigger impression on her because this Chris is the person whose identity Janelle stole to catfish her family. Chris works for security, all right, just not national security. The second Chris comes in, her eyes were just drawn to him, would not leave him. As he yes. testified, her eyes were fixed on him. Because he's the real thing, and he's a good-looking guy. She apparently thought Billy Payne was, too, which is why if she couldn't have him, said the prosecutor, nobody could. Janelle Potter had a crush or some kind of good feelings toward Bill Payne. A biblical crush on him, an epic crush on him. And when he moved on with Billie Jean Hayworth and they had a child, that was it. She went berserk. They would talk about the baby, baby Tyler. They would call him that damn baby. That baby needs to die. No one talks that way about an infant other than a woman, perhaps, who is jealous that that's not her infant. But the prosecutors have a problem. Their evidence is entirely circumstantial. There is nothing directly linking Barbara and Janelle to the crime scene. But can they link them to the convicted murderer, Buddy? If he's not subjected to Barbara Potter as his wife, Janelle Potter as his daughter, is he ever going to be in that kind of situation? He ended up being exactly what he said he was, a contract killer. Yeah. Killing on assignment. He did do that on their wishes. Even if a jury believes they are involved with this, do they take that leap and call it first degree murder? But the jury jumped in with both feet. We, the jury, find the defendant, Barbara May Potter, guilty of first degree murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Janelle L. Potter, 
guilty of first-degree murder. A Washington County, Tennessee jury convicted the pair of first-degree murder in the deaths of Billy Payne Jr. and Billie Jean Hayworth back in 2012. For the families of the victims, an emotional scene. A lot of relief right now. I'm glad that this is finally getting over and that maybe we can let Billy and Billie Jean rest now. And it's amazing to me that these murders were carried out without Janelle Potter ever pulling the trigger herself. Janelle and Barbara got exactly what they took away from Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth. Life behind bars. Shortly after their conviction, I meet up with the big house bunkmates. They chose not to testify at the trial, but we put the questions to Barbara and Janelle that they didn't have to answer in court. Why did you write to Chris that you wanted them dead? I didn't. Yeah, you did, from these emails. Well, you can believe those emails if you want. So who wrote this one, How would I two, know? three, I might have four, wrote, started an email five, that got changed. Six, well, you seven, you I'm telling you. Eight, nine, <laughs> ten, eleven page email. Eleven pages. Mm -hmm. That's a long email. And you write, I will kill if I have to. Not just hurt, but kill. That's not me. That is not me, because I'm not that kind of person. I'm not evil. But probably the most revealing email isn't one Barbara exchanged with Chris, but rather one she sent to herself. A link to a Billy Graham article on forgiveness and murder. A couple weeks before the murders who had uh, searched, can God forgive a murderer? No, I didn't. You That's didn't. not me. No, I did not. I don't want anybody murdered. I did not do that. Maybe you know? I don't know. I would hope not. Do you think if you passed that you'd go to heaven? Yes, definitely. And with a clean conscience. I could die right now. And I would feel good about it. I would go. I love my daughter. I love my husband. But I would not sit here and lie for them. You wouldn't take a hit for your daughter? No, not me. I love her, but I'm not going to serve life for her. No. Apparently, there is a limit to this mother's love, but what's not in short supply in this family are lies. Can God forgive your mother? I'm sure. What about you? I didn't murder anyone. You don't have any responsibility for the murder of Billy Payne, I Billy Jean? No. None? No. No, but you hated them after I time didn't again hate and again. Them, I just disliked them. You hated them enough to tell your father that they were really torturing you. And you must have hated them if what you say is true, that they were harassing you time after I time again and again. I didn't I just disliked them. I wanted to quit. I wanted the harassment to stop. I went through a lot with them, but I never wished them dead. I never wanted them dead. I <laughs> Janelle begins to cry. Is it real or is it just another move in her game of master manipulation? <laughs> Chris was you. No. You are Chris. You invented him like you invented other characters. No, I didn't. He didn't? No. Just happened to be from your email, from your computer, with your fingertips. No. It was from your IP address, I... from your email address. I don't think we're going to get into that. She said Everything no, so. leads back to Chris. Chris and she's, apparently and she's <laughs> created she's this scenario. She stated she's not Chris, and that's what she maintains. Do you feel like you had any responsibility in doing this to him? Janelle Potter shuts down in tears and walks out of our interview and back to her cell. The family that just a month before the murders spent Christmas posing for photos together, now taking a very different kind of snapshot. Does it make you feel any better? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad. I want them to pay for what they've done. I think that Janelle and uh, Barbara are where they need to be. I think they, they deserve every bit of what they've got. The tiny town of Mountain City has gone back to its daily routines, but many people question whether the heart of this story is not about social media, but about something far more timeless. At the root of this case, Janelle Potter was like a lot of adolescent girls who aren't fitting in in a community. It, it turns into an anger. That's what it boils down to. It wasn't defriending on Facebook. It was a jealousy issue. It was somebody with too much time on their hands. As of 2016, Janelle, Barbara, and Buddy Potter 
are all appealing their convictions. Mother and daughter are serving their time in the same Tennessee prison. Both will be eligible for parole in the year 2073, when Janelle would be 91 years old. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.